Hey, it's Leo. Welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about 21 books that I want to include on my TBR for the rest of 2021. And I'm noticing that my camera angle is kind of tilted a little bit. There. Is that, is that better? I mean, I'm not straight, so my camera shouldn't be straight, right? Something like that. Oh, I guess I'm wearing the right shirt for this. This is a Queer Cupcake from Sir Cupcake's Queer Circus. So shout out to them. Amazing local circus company here. We also have to show you the balloon hat my friend Jennifer made me for my birthday. If I put it on, you can't see it in all of its magnificence, uh, but it's pretty fantastic. I got to wear this at the restaurant on Sunday. That was pretty, pretty fantastic. Let's see. Oh, sorry for the squeaking. I think it shrunk a little or I, my head got bigger. I did just come from trapeze class, so maybe my head got swole. Anyway, I'm being ridiculous. Each week on my channel, I lift up a nonprofit that's doing good in the world. I will make a donation and I encourage you to like, share, follow, or donate as you are inspired. This week, I'm lifting up the Mountain Star Relief Nursery in Bend, Oregon. Mountain Star works to prevent child abuse and neglect by assisting vulnerable families and promoting the health and safety of children in Oregon's Deschutes, Jefferson, and Crook counties. I've heard really good things about this organization, and so I'll make a donation and encourage you to like, share, or donate as you are inspired. So now, the rest of 2021 and my TBR. I still have a goal to read 40 eight more books, I believe, by the end of the year in order to reach my goal of 100. I do have probably almost 300 now on my Storygraph TBR, uh, thanks in large part to many of you and the great books that you've been recommending, so thank you. But if you have any recommendations or if you know any reasons why maybe I shouldn't read any of these books on my TBR, please let me know. In my July wrap-up, I'm going to talk about a book that I didn't pay close enough attention to content warnings and um, it led to some disappointment, but you'll have to wait for the next video to hear more about that. The first book I want to talk about is Midnight at Malabar House by Vasim Khan. This is the 2021 winner for the Historical Dagger by the Crime Writers Association. One of the booktube channels that I subscribe to, Pegs Knitting and Book Prizes, shared the link to the Zoom event for the 2021 Crime Writers Association Dagger Awards, so I did get to watch that. Um, it's now on YouTube, but it was just... I don't know what happened outside, but it was a great event. So the Midnight at Malabar House is set in Bombay, New Year's Eve in 1949. As India celebrates the arrival of a momentous new decade, Inspector Persis Wadia stands vigil in the basement of Malabar House, home to the city's most unwanted unit of police officers. Six months after joining the force, she remains India's first female police detective, mistrusted, sidelined, and now consigned to the midnight shift. And so when the phone rings to report the murder of prominent English diplomat, Sir James Harriet, the country's most sensational case falls into her lap. As 1950 dawns and India prepares to become the world's largest republic, Persis, accompanied by Scotland Yard criminalist Archie Blackfinch, finds herself investigating a case that is becoming more political by the second. Navigating a country and society in turmoil, Persis, smart, stubborn, and untested in the crucible of male hostility that surrounds her, must find a way to solve the murder, whatever the cost. The next book is a nonfiction. I'll try to alternate fiction and nonfiction. Um, I do have more fiction on my list though, but this one was recommended in my chaplaincy training. The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma by Bessel A. van der Kolk. The blurb says, renowned trauma expert, Bessel van der Kolk has spent over three decades working with survivors. In The Body Keeps the Score, he transforms our understanding of traumatic stress, revealing how it literally rearranges the brain's wiring, specifically areas dedicated to pleasure, engagement, control, and trust. He shows how these areas can be reactivated through innovative treatments, including neurofeedback, mindfulness techniques, play, yoga, and other therapy. The next book is a fiction recommended by Leanne at Literary Diversions. What she said about this really intrigued me. She just described kind of the buddy banter of the two protagonists and kind of how they were best friends, gave each other crap. I think she likened them to Elliot and Hardison. 
which I loved. This book is Theft of Swords by Michael J. Sullivan. I'd love to know if any of you have read it. The blurb says, there is no ancient evil to defeat or orphan destined for greatness, just unlikely heroes in classic adventure. Royce Melbourne, a skilled thief, and his mercenary partner, Hadrian Blackwater, are two enterprising rogues who end up running for their lives when they're framed for the murder of a king. Trapped in the conspiracy that goes beyond the overthrow of a tiny kingdom, their only hope is unraveling the ancient mystery before it's too late. So I'd love to see the buddy dynamics between Royce and Hadrian. And also, if you have other books to recommend that you really enjoyed, like the 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 dynamic uh, between the two between the characters, I would love to know those. I'm I'm on the hunt for books like that. The next book is a nonfiction. This was recommended on the channel to be black and loved. The book is Freedom is a Constant Struggle. Ferguson, Palestine, and the Foundations of a Movement by Angela Davis. The blurb says, In these newly collected essays, interviews, and speeches, world-renowned activist and scholar Angela Davis illuminates the connections between struggles against state violence and oppression throughout history and around the world. Reflecting on the importance of Black feminism, intersectionality, prison abolition for today's struggles, Davis discusses the legacies of previous liberation struggles, from the Black Freedom Movement to the South African Anti-Apartheid Movement. She highlights the connections and analyzes today's struggles against state terror from Ferguson to Palestine. Facing a world of outrageous injustice, Davis challenges us to imagine and build the movement for human liberation, and in doing so, she reminds us that freedom is a constant struggle. The next book on my TBR is also recommended by Leanne at Literary Diversions. This is The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter by Theodora Goss. The blurb here is pretty interesting. Mary Jekyll, alone and penniless following her parents' death, is curious about the secrets of her father's mysterious past. One clue in particular hints that Edward Hyde, her father's former friend and a murderer, may be nearby, and there is a reward for information leading to his capture a reward that would solve all of her immediate financial woes. But her hunt leads to Hyde's daughter, Diana, a feral child left to be raised by nuns. With the assistance of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, Mary continues her search for the elusive Hyde and soon befriends more women, all of whom have been created through terrifying experimentation. Beatrice Rappaccini, Catherine Moreau, and Justine Frankenstein. When their investigations lead them to the discovery of a secret society of immoral and power-crazed scientists, the horrors of their past return. Now it is up to the monsters to triumph finally over the monstrous. I need to give me a little dongle. Okay. Uh, the next book is a nonfiction that was recommended by Hey, It's Shay. That is Witnessing and Testifying by Rosetta E. Ross. This is a book about the women of the civil rights movement. And so it says the civil rights movement was not only an epochal social and political event, but also a profound moral turning point in American history. Here for the first time, social ethicist Ross examines the religiously motivated activism of black women in the movement and its moral import. Uh, she has a really great review on the on her channel, which I will link down below. Um, so I recommend it and I haven't read it yet, but I'm, I want to get to it in 2021. The next book was recommended by Camilla at Hasty U Books. Um, I know she recommended it um, in, I think her June wrap up. And then also in the mid-year freak out tag, it uh, came up multiple times. Um, so she loved that book and I'm looking forward to reading this. This is A Dictionary of Lost Words by Pip Williams. This is uh, fiction. In 1901, the word bond maid was discovered missing from the Oxford English Dictionary. This is the story of the girl who stole it. Esme is born into a world of words. Motherless and irrepressibly curious, she spends her childhood in the scriptorium, a garden shed in Oxford where her father and a team of de dedicated lexicographers are collecting words for the very first Oxford English Dictionary. Esme's place is beneath the sorting table, unseen and unheard. One day, a slip of paper containing the word bond maid flutters to the floor. Esme rescues the strip and stashes it in an old wooden case that belongs to her friend Lizzie, a young servant in the big house. Esme begins to collect other words from the scriptorium that are misplaced, discarded, or have been neglected by the dictionary men. 
They help her make sense of the world. Over time, Esme realizes that some words are considered more important than others, and that words and meanings relating to women's experiences often go unrecorded. While she dedicates her life to the Oxford English Dictionary, secretly, she begins to collect words for another dictionary, the Dictionary of Lost Words. Set when the women's suffrage movement was at, the, was at its height and the Great War loomed, the Dictionary of Lost Words reveals a lost narrative hidden between the lines of a history written by men. It's a delightful, lyrical, and deeply thought-provoking celebration of words and the power of language to shape the world and our experience of it. The next book is another nonfiction. This is The Portland Black Panthers, Empowering Albina and Remaking a City. I had found this on the Oregon Historical website, uh, on the Oregon Historical Society website, linked down below, of course and it has a great blurb. Portland, Oregon, though widely regarded as a liberal bastion, has also struggled historically with ethnic diversity. Indeed, the 2010 census found it to be America's whitest city. In early recognition of such disparate realities, a group of African-American activists in the 1960s formed a local branch of the Black Panther Party in the city's Albina district to rally their community and be heard by city leaders. And as Lucas Burke and Judson Jeffries reveal, the Portland branch was quite different from the more famous and infamous Oakland headquarters. Instead of parading around the streets wearing black berets and ammunition belts, Portland's Panthers were more concerned with opening a health clinic and starting free breakfast programs for neighborhood kids. Though the group had been squeezed out of local politics by the early 1980s, its legacy lives on through the various activist groups in Portland that are still fighting many of the same battle. Combining histories of the city and its African-American community with interviews with Portland former Panthers and other key players, this long overdue account adds complexity to our understanding of the protracted civil rights movement throughout the Pacific Northwest. It is not as liberal as the media portrays it to be. I do wonder a little bit about the comment on the blurb that the Oakland headquarters, um, that it's different from then because um, it talks about um, opening a health clinic and starting free breakfast programs and I thought that Oakland had done that as well um, so I'll help to learn more about um, the, the Oakland branch as well as the Portland branch um, but I think this is really important history and I'm looking forward to reading this book. All right number nine is a fiction recommended by Greg at Supposedly Fun. That is Camp by L.C. Rosen. The blurb says, 16-year-old Randy Kepelhoff loves spending the summer at Camp Outland, a camp for queer teens. It's where he met his best friends. It's where he takes to the stage in the big musical. And it's where he fell for Hudson Aronson Lim, who's only into straight acting guys and barely knows not at all straight acting Randy even exists. This year, though, it's going to be different. Randy has reinvented himself as Dell, buff, masculine, and on the market. Even if it means giving up show tunes, nail polish, and his unicorn bed sheets, he's determined to get Hudson to fall for him. But as he and Hudson grow closer, Randy has to ask himself how much he is willing to change for love. And is it really love anyway, if Hudson doesn't know who he truly is? I believe this came up on um, multiple videos for Greg at Supposedly Fun, um, including maybe best of 2021 so far for him. So I am going to uh, look forward to checking that one out. All right, we're getting there. Number 10 is another nonfiction, and that is one that you've probably heard of. It is Just Mercy, A Story of Justice and Redemption by Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson was a young lawyer when he founded the Equal Justice Initiative, a legal practice dedicated to defending those most desperate and in need, the poor, the wrongly condemned, and women and children trapped in the farthest reaches of our criminal justice systems. One of his first cases was that of Walter McMillan, a young man who was sentenced to die for a notorious murder he insisted he didn't commit. The case drew Brian into a tangle of conspiracy, political machination, and legal brinksmanship and transformed his understanding of mercy and justice forever. Just Mercy is at once an unforgettable account of an idealistic, gifted young lawyer's coming of age, a moving window into the lives of those he has defended, and an inspiring argument for compassion in the pursuit of true justice. For number 11, I know that I've seen this recommended on multiple channels. Maybe it's been recommended on yours. So if you rec if you have a video where you recommend it, please feel free to drop it in the comments below because I was I 
I can't remember which video I saw this in, but this is Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe by Benjamin Aliri Sciens. Aristotle is an angry teen with a brother in prison. Dante is a know-it-all who has an unusual way of looking at the world. When the two meet at the swimming pool, they seem to have nothing in common. But as loners start spending time together, they discover that they share a special friendship, the kind that changes lives and lasts a lifetime. And it is through this friendship that Ari and Dante will learn the most important truths about themselves and the kind of people they want to be. Number 12 is again nonfiction. This was recommended in Disability Visibility, which I'll be talking about in my July wrap up. The book is The Fearless Benjamin Lay, The Quaker Dwarf Who Became the First Revolutionary Abolitionist by Marcus Redeker. In The Fearless Benjamin Lay, renowned historian Marcus Redeker chronicles the transatlantic life and times of a singular man, a Quaker dwarf who demanded the total unconditional emancipation of all enslaved Africans around the world. Mocked and scorned by his contemporaries, Lay was unflinching in his opposition to slavery, often performing colorful guerrilla theater to shame slave masters, insisting that human bondage violated the fundamental principles of Christianity. He drew on his ideals to create a revolutionary way of life, one that embodied the proclamation, no justice, no peace. Lay was born in 1682 in Essex, England, his philosophies, employments, and places of residence spanning England, Barbados, Philadelphia, and the open seas were markedly diverse over the course of his life. He worked as a shepherd, glove maker, sailor, and bookseller. His worldview was an astonishing combination of Quakerism, vegetarianism, animal rights, opposition to the death penalty, and abolitionism. So I'm really glad that I ran across this recommendation um, that actually Disability Visibility has a whole uh, list of recommendations, but uh, this one just really spoke to me. And so I'm looking forward to reading this in 2021. Number 13 was also recommended on Greg's channel, Supposedly Fun, and that is The Yield by Tara June Winch. Knowing soon that he will die, Albert Poppy Gondawindi has one final task he must fulfill. A member of the indigenous Wiradjuri tribe, he has spent his adult life in Prosperous House in the town of Massacre Plains, a small enclave on the banks of the Murumbi River. Before he takes his last breath, Poppy is determined to pass on the language of his people, the traditions of his ancestors, and everything that was ever remembered by those who came before him. The land itself aids him. He finds the words on the wind. After his passing, Poppy's granddaughter, August, returns home from Europe, where she has lived the past 10 years, to attend his burial. Her overwhelming grief is compounded by the pain, anger, and sadness of memory of growing up in poverty before her mother's incarceration, of the racism she and her people endured, of the mysterious disappearance of her sister when they were children, an event that has haunted her and changed her life. Her homecoming is bittersweet as she confronts the love of her kin and the news that Prosperous is to be repossessed by a mining company. Determined to make amends and honor Poppy and her family, she vows to save their land, a quest guided by the voice of her grandfather that leads into the past, the stories of her people, and the secrets of the river. Told in three masterfully woven narratives, the yield is a celebration of language and an exploration of what makes a place home, a story of a people and a culture dispossessed. It is also a joyful reminder of what once was and what endures, a powerful reclaiming of indigenous language, storytelling, and identity that offers hope for the future. The next book is another fiction, a murder mystery. It is book one in a series. The book two was nominated for the Anthony Awards at Boucheron, the World Mystery Convention next month in New Orleans, which I have never been and don't really know much about. So if you have or know anything about the Anthony Awards, please let me know in the comments. So book one in the series is Murder Knocks Twice by Susanna Calkins. Gina Ritchie takes on a job as a cigarette girl to earn money for her ailing father and to prove to herself that she can hold her own as Chicago's most notorious speakeasy, The Third Door. She's enchanted by the harsh, glamorous world she discovers. The sleek socialites slip sipping bootlegged cocktails. The rowdy ex-servicemen playing poker in the curtained back room. The flirtatious jazz pianist and a brooding photographer. 
all overseen by the club's imposing over owner, Signora Castellazzo. But the staff buzzes it with whispers about Gina's predecessor, who died under mysterious circumstances, and the photographer Marty warns her to be careful. When Marty is brutally murdered, with Gina as the only witness, she's determined to track down his killer. What secrets did Marty capture on his camera, and who would do anything to destroy it? As Gina searches for answer, she's pulled deeper into the shadowy truths hiding behind the third door. The last seven books are all books that I described or mentioned in my last video, so I'm just going to name them here and you can look um, at that video if you'd like more information. Number 15 is The United States of Grace by Lenny Duncan. Number 16, The Body is Not an Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love by Sonia Renee Taylor. Number 17, the Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. Number 18, Baptized in Tear Gas from White Moderate to Abolitionist by L. Dowd. Number 19, Sister Outsider, Essays and Speeches by Audre Lorde. Number 20, Arsenic and Adobo by Mia P. Manansala. And number 21, The Flames of Albion by Jean Menzies. Uh, have you read any of these? What are your thoughts? What is on your TBR or to be read? What do you need to finish by the end of 2021? And what else do I want to know? How are you doing? Please feel free to like and subscribe and comment down below. I'd love to continue the conversation. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for stopping by. Don't forget that you are awesome.